Last time we talked about the deep sea. And I want to um, just talk a little bit more about that in the context of some of the organisms that we might need to think about in terms of management and how that will um, uh, and how that manifests itself in some some different issues. So let's talk about the shallow parts of the ocean and how they interact with the deep parts of the ocean. So we're going to cover a couple things uh, briefly: um, how we how we sample stuff, some of the conditions, a lot of the stuff we've already touched on, and um, in particular, I want to focus on this deep versus shallow connectivity. So as you guys saw last time, the deep sea is a crazy place, an awesome place. A, a, let me kill some of these lights. Might be a little bit easier to see the dark stuff. <clears throat> so the deep sea is this amazing place with all this kind of cool stuff we saw, viewed last time, some great uh, examples of what these creatures do, how they make their living, etc. So uh, from last time, we talked about the deep sea, which we can also talk about as the what? What zone is deeper than 200 meters? Uh, benthic is of or associated with the bottom. It could be, but what's a better term based on light for? Aphotic, yeah. aphotic right? The aphotic, the non-sunlight area. So we're talking about the the areas where it's um, excluding biological derived light, it is perpetually dark. And again, this is a vast swath of the surface of the Earth. As we touched on before, it is difficult uh, just physically to get down there. The crushing pressures, the temperature, all that stuff makes it logistically challenging. And as a consequence, we've only sampled, if we talk about um, the bottom of the ocean, the, the actual benthos, only something on the order of, this number's a little bit old, but maybe it's up to, who knows, maybe 10 square kilometers now. That's not very much, right? It's literally what we're doing with a small robot, small submarine, and, and you know, driving that thing around, or maybe towing a camera behind a ship, something of that nature. we don't fully understand what's going on down here. So this is very much so the early days still, the early days of discovery, the early days of just figuring out what's the what. So virtually every time some of my colleagues go down and look at stuff, they virtually always see something new or some new behavior or what have you. So if, if every time you're going down you see something brand new, it's hard to maybe uh, do a, a holistic synthesis of the ecology down there. And then that makes the management that much harder because we don't necessarily fully understand why critters are where they are, for example. We have traditionally thought of the, the deeper chunks of the ocean as very monotonous and as impoverished relative to the other uh, parts of the planet. And that is not true. So that is not true. So for example, um, while the density can be lower uh, on average, we, we certainly can get areas such as this uh, brittle star and sea star bed where there's high aggregations of individuals, for example. How do we sample this? We have to use remote tools primarily. The, the shallowest of the, of the deep sea we can, people can go down in, in submarines, people can go down in, um, in pressurized suits and the like, but for the majority of this, we're talking about um, uh, remote sampling technology. So first and foremost, um, one of the oldest methods is a so-called box core, and this is aimed at looking at the sediments. So this is essentially a, a, a dump truck bucket like you might think of that you had as a kid in the sandbox, and there's sort of two clamshell halves, and it, and it kind of goes down and it grabs stuff. Another method, another approach would be to drag something along the bottom, something that you could imagine sort of skimming off the top, like, like skimming off the top of the foam of a, of a cup of coffee, something like that. Um, in this case, though, it would be skimming off the, the sediments 
and or the organisms that are just on or right next to the surface or just under the surface with the so-called sled. As I said, we can tow cameras. Some of them can be dumb cameras and it's just a, 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 a aperture pointing one way. Others can be on complex submarines that we can articulate, change the light level, do things like that. Um, and then, of, of course, even more fancy things like our ROVs, like we have in, in the lab behind me, that uh, have cameras, but also might have sampling arms, or might have suction devices, or cages, or something like that to, to not just image, but actually to deliver equipment, or to recover equipment, or to collect organisms, or water samples. And again, for the shallowest of the shallows, we can do things like the Alvin. That, the, that uh, footage we looked at last time was from the Alvin, which is a, a circular, a spherical submarine. And then uh, around that spherical submarine is all this extra white stuff, the, the air tanks and things like that that make it look non-spherical, but basically at the core of it, it's a, it's a big sphere. And so in that case, you humans can, we humans can go down and you can look out of portholes and you can directly observe uh, things going on in the environment around you. As you guys know, this area is, uh, keep harping on this, but is dark, is cold, um, has a relatively constant salinity compared to um, the shallower re areas and the, the areas near the continental margins. And the vast majority of the stuff that's down deep is underneath mud, underneath sediments, underneath um, some type of sediment. In general, the kinds of critters we see down there are phylogenetically very similar to the things that are up shallow. Just there, there are some slight differences, but you know, we have worms up shallow, they have worms down deep. We have cephalopods, octopus, squid, things like that up shallow. They have those guys down deep. They might look different, but evolutionarily they're, they're, um, they're similar. The one big deal is that we don't have down deep, we don't have any um, sun eaters, any light eaters. We don't have any photosynthetic critters, um, although as noted last time, we do have these chemosynthetic critters that sort of serve that role, at least in focal areas, such as around hydrothermal vents, where the folks that, uh, the species that we see there are oftentimes hydrothermal vent endemics. They're, that's where they're found, the only place where they're found. So in other words, a lot of the critters around these hydrothermal vents are found there and maybe in a, one or a few, few other places, we'll look at a, an example of that in a, a little bit, but, but not just off in the random middle part of the uh, ocean. <clears throat> this stuff is, uh, we've already talked about this, but you know, most of the seafloor is down deep. Um, we're, as, you, as we noted last time, we're getting this nutrient input from above, from the light zone of the ocean. We get this, this uh, episodic introduction of materials. And right, okay, good. The stuff we already talked about. Here are some examples of those critters. So we have some vestiminiferum worms on the left and other worm species, polychaetes and other, other groups. We have uh, sponges, we have cnidarians. Uh, so the, that, those are gonna be your um, your anemones and guys like that. Um, a huge, one of the big uh, players down deep uh, in, the, in terms of the benthos, even more so than the shallow, are the echinoderms. So we have things like these crinoids, which are these guys here uh, in the middle. Um, these guys are uh, all, all is echinoderms. These are the sea cucumbers slash uh, sea stars slash um, sea urchins, that whole group of critters that have pentamic symmetry, five-parted symmetry, and have been very successful across planet Earth. A lot of, a lot of snails, a lot of mollusks. So we saw the Dumbo squid last time. 
um, there's there's a whole host of uh, bivalves and and snails like we would see that that are much more that are much more familiar to our shallow water eyes and we can more readily identify those guys. Crustaceans are also uh, pretty, uh, pretty big players down deep. So for example, there's a Yeti crab there on the bottom, um, which is uh, uh, a critter associated with hydrothermal vents. We have some of these giant isopods like in that guy's hands. Um, we have a lot of the guys on the upper right are, are smaller individuals, very important players, planktonic individuals like the amphipod. This guy here is an amphipod um, uh, and the like. Uh, these are barnacles, these are gooseneck barnacles, etc. other barnacles, crabs, shrimp, etc. Uh, I think it's a stomatopod. Um, and just one small illustration of the diversity of stuff we have. This guy's a blind uh, lobster. Unlike last time where I mentioned that um, with some of the shrimp, we were wondering, wow, these guys are all blind. It turns out they weren't blind. We just were blinding them with our uh, underwater ROV, massively gazillion million lumen lights. Um, this guy actually really is uh, blind. But he's got this super funky modified claw. Obviously, that serves some purpose, right? Don't know what that purpose is but cool the fishes which we saw last time as well um, are obviously important and have uh, had specific adaptations um, particularly when it relates to uh, bioluminescence and counter shading and the like we saw examples of that last time on the videos Lots of detrital um, uh, life histories that we saw last time. Um, all kinds of crazy cool stuff. I, I don't know if I'll show you. I don't think I need to show you this video. Um, but again, discovering new fish all the time. In this case is a snail fish. Okay, so the productivity. Uh, generally speaking, with the exception of our hydrothermal vents, we don't have any uh, new primary productivity going on uh, down in the ocean. So what becomes really important is this uh, organic matter, this material transported from the shallows down into the deep. And for, for many uh, intents and purposes, we can consider the bottom of the ocean relatively carbon starved. So carbon sources, which is what you eat, what I eat, what you use to build your body, which I use to build my body, which the plants use to build their bodies, etc. It's, it's uh, not as common as it is in the shallower areas. I already said that. Um, oh, right, yes, yeah, so we get that both from the primary production as well as the other, other parts of our food web that die, right? That, that die and then their, their structures um, persist to the bottom. So here's all the possible ways we can get stuff down into the deep sea. Starting off on the left, we have just simple, simple, a tree falls down even, you know, a palm tree, let's say, falls down. And, and in theory, it can make its way to the bottom. Seagrass, algal fronds, all that kind of stuff can, can float down. We have the plankton we mentioned last time. The plankton, in particular, the calcareous plankton, the guys with calcium carbonate, carbonate shells. And the silicaceous phytoplankton are the guys with glass-like shells. Um, so those guys are doing their stuff and they, um, they will drop out. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about yet, but it's an important phenomenon and it has to do in some cases with some fisheries management is, uh, so most of these things I'm showing arrow down, arrow down, right? Um, some things can go down and go up even though they're quote unquote plankton. So there's a, a mass migration that goes on every day across planet Earth. The largest migration is critters that are moving in, in relation to the sun. Primarily, we're talking about small things. Well, I mean, big things too, but, but, but the initiator of this is the, are the small, well, let me delete that, never mind. So we have this huge, I'll restart. So we have this huge migration that happens every day on planet Earth. Sun goes, so sun is up and a lot of guys are down here, right? Guys that might be seen 
guys that can't easily swim away from, say, a predator. Okay, so they're hanging out down there. But maybe they really like to eat things and their food is hanging up shallow here. Their food is up in the photic zone. Their food is maybe phytoplankton, right? So the guys that, are, that, are, that need to be in the sunlight area so they can photosynthesize. So these guys are gonna wait for the sun to go down and they're like, damn nation, man, I'm going up here. And so they go up here and they go up and now all the phytoplankton is up here. So, so they're eating. But as they're eating, other things are gonna come up too, right? And other things are gonna come up, etc. And they're gonna all be everybody eating on everybody in the, in the dark, in the relative dark of the shallower waters. Then the night ends and as the sun starts to come up, these guys are like, oh damn, I gotta get out of here. So then they go back down. So this, this, this daily migration up and down is going on all the time, primarily zooplankton, but also fish will track with that as well, and to an extent squid as well. So in this case, this is, this is, this is sort of one of these arrows, or, or uh, potentially up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, potentially. Uh, then we have critters that have heavy substances that they get rid of. So our invertebrates, they have these exoskeletons, when they want to get bigger, eventually, you know, when you want to get bigger, you just get bigger and you add to your bone and you add to your muscle and you and you get taller and wider and et cetera. Because you have an internal skeleton. And these guys have an exoskeleton. So if they want to get bigger, they're physically contained within the box that is their skeleton. So if they want to get bigger, what they have to do is they they essentially lay down a new skeleton in physiologically inside of their old skeleton. And then with things like, say, this shrimp that's il illustrated here, um, they will uh, once that's ready, they basically break their back, they kick and they, they, they crack open their back, and then they back themselves out of their skeleton. And then as soon as that newly laid proto-exoskeleton is there, it's going to make contact with seawater and it's going to swell up, so it's going to get bigger and, make, and, and expand. And then over the course of usually a few hours, it'll harden into the, the rigid structure that it ultimately will be. So that's great, but as soon as I'm done, if I'm in the midwater, I'm doing that, and I kick, my, kick out, and then I kick away, and then that old husk of my exoskeleton, that's gonna be usually denser than seawater, that's gonna tend to sink. So that's an important source of carbon down into the deep. Uh, one that is, uh, inc has become increasingly important after World War II, and we'll, we'll, uh, we haven't talked about fisheries yet, but we will, but um, is this notion of bycatch. So we want the tuna, but we accidentally got a bunch of sharks, let's say. But we don't want those sharks because they're not high value. We only have so much space in our freezer. So we'll take those sharks and throw them overboard. Sometimes those sharks are, or those organisms are alive and they can just go about their lives. But usually they're, they're man, maimed or just outright dead or whatever. And or with a large factory ship, we might be um, getting the target organism but we might be gutting the fish and, and, and just keeping the fillets and then all the guts and everything you might just throw overboard. So, you know, if you're on your little skiff off the Channel Islands and did that, not a big deal. But if you're a big, large factory vessel, that could amount to a large source of organic material going down into the deep. Whale falls, we'll talk about this uh, shortly, but this is an important thing. And then um, floating algae, and then when, when uh, everybody poops. So when, when things in the ocean poop, it eventually goes down. Cool? Those are all, is there anything else I've left off? Can you guys think of anything else that, uh, a source of organic material from the shallows to the deep? No, I'm just that engaging. Great, good. Okay. Yeah, I can't think of any either. But those, those are that's that's exhausted my thought process. Okay. We start off from the assumption that on average, yes, there's always some hot spots, but on average, the inputs to the global ocean to two thirds of the Earth's surface is on a per unit area basis is low. So so it's it's relatively poor um, in terms of input. And most of these things that I've shown you right here, most of these things are, are dead stuff, right? They are, they are exoskeletons, they're poop, they're, they're things of that nature. 
So the material that does get down is generally low energy or, or, or not a rich source of, chem of, of fat and things of that nature, right? We're talking more structural um, materials. And we think it's a, and we start off thinking it's atypical that these inputs might be really energy rich. That might be a real nice fancy steak. That doesn't seem to be um, the, uh, very likely. So the first is that we, we, we're generally assuming things are, is, is a low energy input across the globe. Next, um, how that stuff goes in and where that stuff goes in is has historically thought to be, meh, whatever. You know, it's kind of spread out over the whole area or it's random, etc. So there's no, no, no particular structure underlying the spatial distribution of inputs to the bottom of the ocean. Increasingly, as we look at this, we don't find that to be the case, but, but this is still early on in this. Um, but there does appear to be increasing uh, hints that there is some structure to the spacing of these inputs. And then thirdly, um, the timing of the inputs, uh, again, thought to be more or less random slash constant, no, no clear pattern. And as we, again, as we've looked at this, it's um, quite clear that there are clear timing events such as uh, seasons, such as after uh, major storm events, things of that nature. And I'll direct you over to the, the graph on the upper right which is an illustration of whale, great whale migration routes. What we see there is, yeah, there's, there in theory can be whales everywhere, but they really tend to concentrate on these areas between feeding grounds and, and breeding grounds. And so there, there, there does tend to be consistent patterns. If there wasn't consistent patterns, we would not have the whale watching industry that's grown up over the last 40 years. Um, and, and those guys wouldn't be able to make a living because they wouldn't know when the whales were coming or not, or not coming. But obviously that, uh, that's not the case. So um, before we talk about that, I'll, I'll just finish this off with a little bit of discussion of zonation related to depth and then, and then the stuff at hydrothermal vents. So the particular, so the organic inputs to the deep sea uh, again, we, this is clearly related to the diversity that's down there, so that's why we care about this for management, because we, we want to be able to at least grossly get a sense of where the inputs are, therefore where the maybe larger biomass, more diverse areas might be. Um, in general, uh, low in the tropics, high in the, so again, just paralleling the productivity of the surface waters, so therefore relatively low in the tropics, relatively high in the temperate and coastal zones. Um, particularly important seasons, in the temperate areas, in the tropics, there's not so much, you know, season. It's more consistent temperatures, et cetera, throughout the year, whereas, whereas we have Christmas and summertime and things like that as we get farther and farther away from the tropics. <clears throat> and this is the pattern that we see with particulate organic matter, with the organic input, which is shallow. We see a lot. And then as we go uh, deeper, it's going to decay off. It's going to decay off because critters are feeding off that particular organic matter as it goes through the water column. And generally speaking, most of this stuff, the other thing I should have mentioned, I don't think I did, but in terms of the quality of this stuff, I'm drawing it with this illustration as if it starts, the little, the little molt starts here and goes to the bottom, and the fish carcasses start here and go to the bottom. But realize this is not an instantaneous process. And the, the um, slower the item sinks, the more likely somebody's going to bump into it on the way down. And if there's some high quality resource in there, maybe that, that organism it's encountering is going to utilize that. So that as it's, it's not as if we have source, use of the material. It's source, and then as it's going down, there might be critters sucking out some of the value of that, of that material all the way down. So by the time we get to the bottom, it's the very end of the tailpipe. Um, and, so, and so that's one of the reasons why you know, some of it's consumed as we go down. Um, 
Right. And I already said this, but more, more carbon is more uh, stuff. So this is the pattern we tend to see that um, uh, the density of critters declines with depth. We just, and we, that just parallels the, the particular organic matter. The biomass similarly declines with depth. So this, this would be, let's say, in a cubic meter of water we sampled and we captured all the living things and weighed them on a scale, all right? That's going to decline as we go down with depth. But interestingly, diversity appears to be peaking at intermediate depths. Again, we're still learning about this. There's, we're just barely scratching the surface. But from what we've pulled in so far, it does appear to be something akin to an intermediate disturbance hypothesis or, or an intermediate um, peak in diversity. Don't know why, but that is the pattern. So density of individuals declines exponentially. Biomass per unit area declines exponentially. But species richness peaks at intermediary depths. Uh, we talked about last time the, the zonation at hydrothermal vents. And, and uh, we, we touched on it at least. But um, there's going to be zonation with a whole variety of factors. But the easiest one to think about is just the temperature of the water. This stuff can be boiling when it's coming out of the ocean. So there's going to be some critters that can take that boiling or near boiling temperature. And then as we go even just a foot or two away, the temperature can drop dramatically. And so then there's some other critters that can live in that uh, and, and or thrive in that uh, region. And then, uh, you know, continuing on as we go farther away. So worms, like these annelid uh, worms, uh, vestiminiferans, bivalves, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, right. So we're going from the, the bacteria-dominated critters um, that have these associated chemosynthetic microbes inside of them to organisms that are more similar to the stuff we have uh, up shallow as we get farther away from that. <clears throat> In some, in, in these areas, especially near these uh, uh, high sources of energy, like the hydrothermal vents, they can be very high density. But we tend to see low dominance, meaning meaning it, it isn't always the same um, species that uh, uh, dominates the composition. And again, just like we talked about this last time, this appears to be driven by um, this. Well, we don't know. One hypothesis is that that is happening because of the the relative lack of food overall, and, uh, and a few other things. Let's skip that. OK, here we go. Anybody know what this is? Oh, good. Octopus in the middle, good. But the, but the bigger thing, the bigger sort of beige thing around, around the octopus. Ooh, good guess, coral. Okay, but it's not. Yes, it's not. Somebody had a yeah. Carcass, like a whale. Yes, it's a whale skull. It's a dead whale. In this case, it's part of an experiment, and these guys have marked it. So they put a lead weight right here. These guys from Hawaii put a lead weight, and they have a a, a rope here that goes to a float, so they can easily relocate it. But this is a dead whale, also known. A dead whale at the bottom of the ocean is also known as a whale fall, as in fell to the bottom of the ocean. Again, way back when, people thought, ah, random. Whales are all over the ocean. I don't know. The ocean's massive. There's no structure to it. Whales just die. That doesn't appear to be the case, right? Rather, whales seem to track with um, the areas where the adults are moving through or moving to. And so here's just a few examples of those showing how the whale falls are along migration routes. And, um, and these whale falls are, in, in a sense, one of these episodic, yeah? Um, is there anybody studying like, how long it takes for a whale to fall to the bottom, like from what point? And yes. Well, yeah, I mean, whales will go down pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so what will happen is, the, so if a whale, let's say, is hit by, struck by a ship, whale strike, 
it'll be dead and it, it's there's a lot of fat so that whale will kind of be in there on the surface and it'll die just like you would die and the whale has a gut and the whale has you know bacteria and stuff and so as soon as we die those bacteria etc are like i'm getting out of here and so the whale will start to rot so they'll start to bloat so initially a dead whale you know all things being equal if nobody's cutting it open or whatever it's going to float on this float on the surface right because it's going to be buoyed up by its the internal gases and and the blubber and things um, but after a period of time when the sharks start eating it and, you know, this and that, uh, eventually the weight of the bones is going to start to pull it down. So it'll start to sink. If it, if it sinks, um, it can go fairly fast. So over the course of a few hours, it can make it to the bottom. I mean, it's going to depend on how deep it is, right? But for these types of things, these manipulative experiments, what these guys do is they, they get a dead whale. I mean, they don't kill a whale, but they, they you know, um, they usually, usually design it as an opportunity not an opportunistic experiment, but they need to wait to find a dead whale. So they'll be doing their do, 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 do. Oh, and then a dead whale, either because of an accident or just we don't know why, but it washes up on shore. So the idea then is grab it with essentially a crane or some type of device, drag it, and then drag it out to sea, and then drop it right over a spot. And so um, a lot of times they will um, like wrap chains and stuff around it or something to pull it down um, and just to make sure it goes down quick. Because in these studies, they, um, they're trying to look at the, the, how quickly it disappears. So generally speaking, people aren't so interested in the transportation time down. They're more interested in how long it persists. Because again, that's going to be on the order of hours or so. So that's, that's not that interesting. Um, whereas the how long it persists, huge range and lots of implications for management and stuff like that. Cool. Other questions? So, so whale falls, again, are, I think we should think of them like hydrothermal vents as one of these so-called atypical, quote unquote, events. But atypical in the sense of, you know, every square inch of the ocean. But these, yeah, okay, I'll just hold on to that. So here's some data from about a decade or so ago. Um, wherein folks uh, did not uh, st uh, uh, stalk the whales in the water, but rather were looking around, found, encountered dead whale carcasses, and went to the bones and did some uh, carbon dating and basically figured out how old those bones were. And so this is what we have. So we have the, um, the uh, essentially, essentially we, have, we have the age of this of these bones. And what you see is there's, there's a fair amount that are on the order of five years to, to 10 years of age. Oh, sorry. This is all, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, never mind. This involves other data sources too. But the point, the point being is these guys range in age from um, a, few ten, a few years to a few tens of years. So the oldest one we have is um, about 100 years. But most of these guys are falling on this pretty even curve. So, so the, the age of these guys seems to be f following a fairly typical um, prediction. This is what we have. When we have that, that whale carcass getting to the bottom of the ocean, the first thing that comes in are the guys that are needing the highest quality energy resources. So that would be the mobile scavengers, big things. So these would be things like hagfish, off to the right, uh, things like um, bony fish that you're used to seeing, sharks, etc. And they're going to basically mack all the soft stuff, all the blubber, all the muscle tissue, that kind of stuff. They'll gobble that all up. Then once those guys are gone, we're going to essentially have these um, uh, critters that are going to start to look at the resource in the bones themselves. And so these are going to be things that are going to further uh, break down the fats and, and, and marrow and things of that nature, etc. As, as these guys are dissolved, as, as this guy is rotting or dying, 
he's, he's not going to be suspended above the bottom. He's going to be on the bottom. And so a lot of times these oils and different substances will, will leach into the surrounding soil and essentially enrich, I shouldn't say soil, I should say sediment, uh, enrich the surrounding sediment. And so uh, you can get uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide compounds produced. And so you can get these um, critters that uh, thrive off the sulfur bonds uh, coming on in. And then eventually, after we've gone through all these stages, eventually it, it, everything's decayed, the bones are gone, the, the fats are gone, everything's gone, and we're left with the bottom of the ocean again. So this is what that looks like. So these are some cartoons from University of Hawaii that illustrate this. So, um, so here's this, in case it's, like, I don't know, a gray whale, I guess, has gone down. And so, boom, he's on the bottom. First thing, have all these hagfishes that are there, all these uh, you know, ratfish, all these guys are coming in, they're starting to mack on them. Uh, and then after we finish that phase, after you know, weeks to, typically weeks to maybe a month or two, then we have these uh, opportunistic critters coming in that are gonna sort of pick over the remains, pick over the bones, the, the more finely uh, uh, scaled guys. So these guys, this white over here is, is showing um, these, this field of these guys, again, feeding off the fats that have kind of sort of seeped into and enriched the surrounding sediments. And then we'll have these guys that come in and actually uh, start to get some of the um, uh, sulfur compounds, including this guy, the so-called bone devourer, which is a worm that, uh, so here's the bone right here, and here are the worm, the worms are, are uh, on the surface, and so the part that we typically look at is on the top, but actually they have these digestive structures down inside and are essentially, you can think of it as almost like rotting out or feeding off of the, the compounds in the bone, yeah. Uh, what was the last stage of the whale fall succession? The sulfonic species? Uh, uh, right after that, wasn't there a fourth one? It's just, it's just, it just, it goes, it's just, gone, the, the done with it. And so here's an interesting uh, observation. So um, most of the critter, most of, of these, of the guys that are colonizing this, the single celled guys, let's say, the invertebrates, uh, have planktonic larvae, meaning the adults are associated with the, the reef or the whale or the vent or what, what have you. But the babies, the dispersive stage, the young stage, is actually a planktonic one. So they're not a, they're just floating in the water column. But like we said right, right here, that we start to get the large mobile scavengers come in within a few weeks. Then these opportunistic things, like some of these bacteria starting to break down the bones, those guys come within, say, many weeks to months or so. So it's not as if this whale carcass sits down there for a century and then somebody finds them. Things find them relatively quickly. But these whale carcasses could be, say, a thousand kilometers from the nearest hydrothermal vent or farther. So my question for you is, how can that happen? I mean, I mean how, can, how can those guys get there? If we have a whale fall, boom, a whale dies and then, and then gets to the bottom of the ocean, and within a relatively short amount of time, these organisms, some of which are shared with hydrothermal vent communities, how can they get to the, how can they find these whales uh, so quickly? You guys have any guesses? Sure, some kind of maybe chemical, maybe they're just everywhere. Maybe they're covering the entirety of the, or, or at least they're very, very common across the deep sea. And they just kind of do their do, and they just, they just, they're in, you know, downward dog yoga position. They're just sort of chilling. And then when they smell something, when they get a chemical signal that, uh, I don't know, rot, whatever, <laughs> ode de rotten whale, or whatever it's called, whenever they sense that, maybe they start to swim differently. Maybe they swim straight down, or something like that. So, okay, so some kind of chemical trigger. Any other ideas? Devin, give me an idea. Give me so how 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 might we get some of these um, individuals? Is there any, like, vibrations when it falls? Or maybe they feel some sort 
Oh, okay, some maybe some some tactile sense, possibly. Other other thoughts? No other thoughts. Nobody has. Yeah. When they kill it. It's almost the same way with those sound waves. They kill it, hit the ground, and it's like an earthquake. Possibly, probably not, but possible. Possible. Is that a temperature thing? Whatever heat is given off by it. Oh. I don't know, possibly. Probably not, given that when the critter dies, he's probably within the course of a you know, hour or two, probably gonna yeah. But okay, good. So you guys are, you guys are think okay, so maybe, maybe. Um, that's not good, that's good here. So here's here's here are these whales whale falls, right? So these whale falls are on consistent um, uh, spatial patterns. Where are the hydrothermal vents? Do you guys remember where those vents are? By emerging plates. Right, by, by, by active, active volcanic plate boundaries, right? And a lot of those, for example, on the west coast, that's sort of the same place, right? So, um, so we don't know. The answer is we don't know. <laughs> we don't know why why these these organisms were able to pop up so quickly on these whales. For that matter, so quickly pop up on the hydro, on like let's say a brand new hydrothermal vent that just erupts. Also, similarly, relatively quickly colonized. Some people have postulated that these these uh, microbes are down in the oh, in the um, geological structure of the Earth, so that there's this network, right? There's sort of this this population living or at least at least sort of hibernating or something down deep maybe probably not but maybe um, but the point is currents aren't random right currents are fairly consistent right currents are fairly consistent we have these these uh, whale fall movements aren't are fairly consistent so it's not as random as it might think it's not as if we're throwing a dart on the ocean and then you're throwing another dart on the ocean so this notion, even though these things might, might, might be really far apart, it might be a thousand kilometers apart, it might be downwind, if you will, or down current of uh, an existing vent or an existing whale fall that can essentially colonize or provide the propagules to colonize stuff. So um, we're not sure how it works, to be totally honest, uh, but the assumptions that we oftentimes make when we ask these questions are usually wrong and that it's not as completely random and as blank a slate as we might otherwise think. Getting back to the bottom of the ocean now, there really is a, a high amount of spatial uh, variation at the small scale. So if we look close, such as right here on the lower left, there actually is a, a good amount of fine scale variation guys that are burrowing in the mud, guys that have burrowed in the mud that are kicking up sediment, making little mini volcanoes of sediment, stuff like that. Um, there, there's, there's a high amount of variation at a very small spatial scale. The other thing that, that does seem to be pretty persistent is these, now, so don't confuse this with diversity necessarily, but in terms of the changes, not a lot of changes, right? There isn't a whale fall falling every square meter for, you know, all month kind of thing. So we have slow changes to the sediment that tend to translate into relatively stable sediments down below. So this, this pattern of, of, you know, uh, on the, the sediment, the mud at the bottom, they're not being disturbed very often. And so when we talk about things like, one, deep sea mining to get those manganese nodules that we've d talked about, or, for example, dragging a net across the bottom to catch some, say, benthic-associated fish or something, that's going to have major scars, right? Analogous, in terms of the, the structure on the bottom of the ocean, analogous to clear-cutting by dragging, say, a big rake across the bottom of the ocean. But it's not like our sandy beaches. When we drag a rake across our sandy beaches, then the wind is woo, 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 and the tides are bang, 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 
and within an hour or a few hours, the sands have reshifted and, and readjusted. It's not like that. So whatever impacts we do have down below, intentional or unintentional, are going to have a very, it can take a long time to recover from. So this notion that the bottom of the ocean is whatever, we can just do whatever, there's not much down there. Whatever impact we do have will persist. And so deep sea mining is but um, one example of that. So okay, so to finish this up, so in summary, uh, deep sea, very uh, two thirds of the earth, surface of the earth is, is down deep down there. We don't know much about this, so I don't have a whole lot of details I can, sh I can tell you, but we're learning more every day. But it is relatively uh, unstudied. Again, the dominant thing there, no pr by and large, no primary production, only that excluding the, the chemosynthetic critters, no primary production. So most of the story is what's being imported from elsewhere, imported from above. Um, the density and biomass of critters is strongly tied to the input of that material from outside. We have this uh, strong depth related zonation where we have a lot of stuff up shallow. Then as we go down deeper, we have this decay of, of uh, material and critters. And uh, also that leads to some zonation too. We didn't talk too much about that. Talk a little bit about the critters moving up and down. But we did talk about the zonation in terms of proximity to a hydrothermal vent. So there is, there is spatial pattern in the ocean. Folks that haven't thought about this or, or have old thinking will say there is no spatial pattern for the distribution of critters down deep. There absolutely is. And uh, uh, we're not entirely sure what's driving the diversity down deep. But um, there are areas of high diversity, particularly at intermediary depths. Cool? All right. Rock a rock a roll.